Hey, I will admit everyone. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. My name is Greg Leparati. I'm in the Office of Alumni Relations at Baruch, and we're so glad to have you joining us this evening. I am Zooming from Queens in New York City. Uh, I encourage all of you to put in the chat where you're Zooming from. It's been great to see so many alumni joining us for these events all across the city, all across the country, even all across the world. We've had people from Europe, Asia. It's been really wonderful. Uh, and now to kick things off, I would like to hand it over to my colleague, Alexandria, to begin tonight's event. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Greg. Um, I just want to remind everyone for tonight's session that we ask that you keep your cameras um, and microphones off just while the panelists are presenting. Um, and this is bound to be an illuminating um, session today, so I'll just pass it over to uh, our host for the evening, my colleague, Nathalie Daniel. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on behalf of the Robert C. Weaver Society. We introduce this webinar as the racism pandemic, and this is a much needed conversation and definitely timely. And before I begin, I just want to say thank you to the panelists and also the moderator for participating um, in this webinar this evening. And let us begin. First, I'd like to introduce our um, panelists and a moderator, our first panelist, is Dr. Regina Bernard Carino, who's the Associate Professor of the Black and Latino Studies at Baruch College. Dr. Barina Carino was born and raised in Hell's Kitchen. She was the first graduate of the African American Studies Master's Degree Program at Columbia University, where she studied under the direction of the late Dr. Manning Maribel. She later became the first student to complete her MPhil and PhD degrees in urban education at CUNY's Graduate Center. As an associate professor of the Black and Latino Studies at Brew College, her courses are particularly focused on race, identity, and culture. She is the author of Black and Brown Waves, The Cultural Politics of Young Women of Color and Feminism, published in 2009, and Neuroorganics, Organic Intelligence, Tele oh, excuse me, Intellectualism, The Search for Racial Identity in Norican Thought, published in 2010, and Say It Loud, Black Studies, Its Students, and Racialized Collegiate Culture, published in 2014. She has also authored pieces for a variety of books, collected editions, and new media. Welcome, Dr. Carino. Thank you for having me. Our next panelist is Dr. Kimberly Chu. Dr. Kimberly Chu currently serves as the Associate Director for Executives on Campus at Baruch College. Dr. Chu began her career with the City University of New York in 2004, working at both Hunter College and Borough of Manhattan College. Dr. Chu has extensive experience in career development, working with students one-on-one -on -one and in groups in areas such as resume writing, interview building, job searching, networking, branding, career exploration, and interpretation of career assessments. Dr. Chu is also an adjunct professor in the Hunter College Counseling Program, where she teaches a multicultural and diversity course to expiring mental health and school counselors. The courses are designed to increase student knowledge and awareness about how race, culture, gender, sexual orientation, religion, and social class impact self and the counseling relationship, as well as to gain an understanding of suitable multicultural intervention strategies. Welcome, Dr. Chu. Welcome, thank you for having me. And our final, final, final panelist is Dr. Karanja Carroll, who's an adjunct assistant professor of Black Studies at Brew College. Dr. Carroll is a currently an independent scholar. From 2006 to 2015, he taught at the State University of New York at New Paltz in the Department of Black Studies. Throughout his teaching career, Dr. Carroll has taught at a variety of colleges, including Montclair State University, William Patterson University, Seton Hall University, Hunter College, Sullivan County Community College, and the County College of Morris. His teaching and research interests revolve around African-centered theory and methodology with an emphasis on social and psychological theory. His publications have appeared in the Journal of Pan-African Studies, Western Journal of Black Studies, 
Journal of the International Study of Teacher Education, Critical Sociology, Race, Gender, and Class, and numerous edited volumes. Dr. Carroll is an African-centered social theorist who is thoroughly committed to the African-centered imperative, one that is grounded in the creation and utilization of culturally specific frameworks in order to understand and create solutions for humanity. Welcome, Dr. Carroll. And our moderator for this evening is the Dr. David Birdsell, who is the Dean and Professor of the Austin W. Marks School of Public and International Affairs at Baruch College. Dean Birdsell has centered his academic work on the nexus of communication, media, and information technology in politics, government, and nonprofit administration. An expert on political debating and widely published on communication theory and practice, Dean Birdsell is a regular guest commentator on debates and other aspects of political communication for television and print media. His work has been supported by the Pew Charitable Trust, the IBM Endowment for the Study of Business and Government, the Lyndon Baines Johnson Foundation, the New York Community Trust, the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation, the United Way of New York City, the Markle Foundation, and other funders. Dean Birdsell is a past president of their network of schools of public policy, affairs, and administration. He chairs the boards of Governance Matters in the New York Federal Statistical Research Data Center. He is a member of the board of the New York Council of Nonprofits and a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. Welcome, Dean Birdsell. Great once to be again, here. Thank you. Once again, I thank you all for being here and we're in for quite a discussion and we all look forward to it. Dean Birdsell, I turn it over to you right now. Thank you so much, Natalie. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's great to be here with our distinguished panelists tonight addressing an absolutely critical question. And I should say really set of questions. We have so much to talk about tonight. Just one more program note before I get into the substance with our panelists. We're going to talk among ourselves. We have about an hour's worth of conversation to have at that phase of the, of, of the presentation. And then we'll have an opportunity to get to the questions that you ask in the, text, uh, in, in the chat uh, uh, box that you can enter questions at any time. And when we start getting to that phase of the program, we'll go ahead and get those questions teed up uh, by someone, uh, both uh, Greg and Alexandria, from whom you heard earlier, uh, will be reading those questions when we make sure we get to as many of them as possible. So without further ado, uh, let me ask all the panelists to reflect on the major tectonic issues that we're talking about here. And I'd like to tee this up this way. Uh, many people are concerned and have long condemned racists um, but when they think about structural racism, that's something really different, right? Uh, if I could ask each of you to talk, and they're related in obvious ways, but I'd like you to talk about, uh, from your perspective, what are we talking about when we're dealing with, under the title of this evening's racism pandemic, structural or uh, uh, systemic racism versus uh, a, a person with personally racist feelings? And I wonder, Regina, if we could start with you. So, yeah, thanks, David. Um, when I think of structural racism uh, juxtaposed to maybe an independent call uh, of a racist, I'm also thinking of how this person benefits from structural racism. Um, and so sort of like being birthed from structural racism. Um, the example of structural racism that I would give are sort of at a basic level for those of us who do this work. Um, policies that discriminate against housing, uh, environmental racism, um, the housing projects being primarily filled with lead pipes, um, school, school issues, school admissions, exams that are biased. Um, so I think that's when I think on a basic level of what structural racism is, I think of that as sort of a tower and then racist coming out of that or benefiting from that system that's in place. I'd like to go to Karanja in just a moment, but let me follow up with one point, Regina. Uh, if someone does not perceive him or herself to be racist, uh, does that person still, if that person is white, uh, benefit from structural racism? Uh, is, there, is it always the case that people of color are on the receiving end of a lot of difficulties created by structural racism? 
So that's a great question. I think that um, I'll, uh, this is sort of twofold in that the first perspective that you can take on this is thinking about the great Paulo Freire and sort of his uh, position on awakening, one's awakening. Um, and that's not something that any of us can do for anyone else. So those who come into their own and come into their knowing about whether they're racist or accepting the fact that there might be privileged is not for any one of us in the field or any person of color to really point out. The second position I would take is Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum, who is a black psychologist, um, who states that there is no benefit for people of color for being racist. So inherent raci racism is something that really needs to be deconstructed and not, cannot be sort of um, positioned in a way where I can say, well, did you know you were racist? I mean, I, maybe you don't know, but I'm here to tell you. Um, I think the system, structural racism has been in place to get to support one and not the other. Thank you so much. Karanja, I wonder if we can get you to weigh in here on these questions. And if you have examples from your own personal activism that you'd like to fold in here, uh, this would be a great time to begin to mine that very rich vein. All right. I think um, when we are trying to define racism, um, I see it as institutional and structural, but I also think that it's important to throw in the mix the terms of prejudice and discrimination because these terms are used interchangeably when in reality they are clear and distinct, or at least the way that I conceptualize them, talk about them, and teach about them in my classes. So when we talk about prejudice and discrimination, we're talking about thoughts, ideas in regards to prejudice, discrimination in regards to actions that are taken. Neither of those terms are connected or have to be connected to race or racism. Racism, on the other hand, is fundamentally connected to race, which means that you need a concept of race before you can, you know, have racism exist. And I talk about this in my classes by like, you know, by having a concept of race, you then have a target for a victim. And therefore, you have a, a, a focus upon where that energy is being placed in regards to who is a victim of racism. So having clarity on those concepts is important. Also, in regards to racism, um, we need to be concerned, we need to be mindful that because it's institutional, because it's structural, yes, individuals benefit, yes, individuals can be uh, uh, actors and, and racist, but the reality is that there's a system in place that allows people to benefit, and those benefits uh, um, are structural. I, and one example that I, I talk about is like, you know, when you deal with all of this police violence, um, that takes place by indi individual police officers who are then able to go to a court system that then allows them to go free. Now, we have some examples of police officers who are actually, um, you know, getting some level of, uh, uh, you know, being penalized at some level. But the fact that there is a legal system that protects them means that there is an institutional and structural element that allows people to do clearly problematic things that are connected to racism and then still get off scot-free. So again, you need to have that institutional structure as a means of protecting actions that, that take place. Thank you. Kimberly, if I can uh, pose the same question to you, but also given your work in, uh, in, in the counseling environment to talk about some of the ways that this impacts people's mental health. Sure. Uh, so when I think of structural racism, for me, I think I define it or I see it as, you know, laws or practices that are established that really end up producing racial inequalities. And, you know, it's embedded in our society and it hurts millions of people in our society today. Um, and part of when we talk about structural racism, for me, I, I tie it into the terminology that I think many of us have heard of is white privilege. Um, there's this belief that white privilege is a result of racism, which I'm sure we'll get into a little bit later. Um, in terms of the mental health and the impact that it's had on us, I mean, we have to have these conversations on racism. And I think it's a topic that a lot of us avoid because either there's this fear of we we're being called a racist or there's this fear that we might hurt somebody else's feelings or, you know, there's also sometimes guilt that we, um, you know, have been mistreated or we feel. So it's a conversation that's really important that we need to have and 
you know, that we have to talk about because if we don't talk about this, it, I think it just builds up and, you know, sometimes feelings of anger or, you know, feeling bitter or feelings of hatred start to build up. And so we need to talk about this as a community. Are those imperatives different for uh, white people and people of color? Can you reflect on that a little bit? Uh, and I'd like then to pivot to this question of white privilege. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I feel that when it comes to this topic of racism, um, again, what people of color experience, I think they feel this more, like I said, more anger, more hopelessness, more they're getting tired, you know, and this is why I think even if we look at this whole, all this protest that's happening, it's people are tired of seeing this happen over and over, right? And so with white people, uh, white privilege, are the feelings the same? Possibly, but I think it's more, they don't know how to, sometimes it's difficult to have the conversation. It's more, they're confused. They don't know where to start. And it's, it it's uncomfortable for them to have those conversations. This is a, an interesting area, and I wonder if we could spend a couple of minutes here uh, before getting into why we're seeing such an upwelling of recognition and so much activity right now. Uh, some reasons are obvious, some perhaps less so, but before getting there, uh, let's talk about this question of white privilege. And one way that white privilege manifests is that white people don't need necessarily to talk about race because there is this implicit assumption that the white way is the normative way, right? That whiteness has been normalized and, uh, and, and that's part of the privilege, the structure of privilege. Uh, can, can, and, and, and let me stipulate that lots of white people don't feel privileged, right? I mean, it, it, and it's, it's the case that many white people are poor, addicted to drugs, uh, don't have a job, and they say, what are you talking about privilege? Um, I wonder, uh, Karanja, if we could start with you, uh, if you could talk about how we can understand white privilege, even for people who, relative to their position in a social hierarchy, uh, are not privileged uh, by many definitions. So again, if we're understanding racism as institutional and structural, we do not need to look for individual white people who are benefiting. We just have to understand that white people as a collective are benefiting. And the easiest example for me has to deal with public school curriculum. When you look at the very nature of the curriculum, when you deal with the focus within the curriculum, when you look at the people who are elevated compared to the voices that are not in included, and when all of that feeds into notions of whiteness, it feeds into a notion of belonging, that functions for me as a means of privilege because stories, narratives, histories, experiences are privileged. And those, privilege, th those experiences usually come from those who are white heterosexual males. And therefore, what we have is a curriculum that students of color are forced to participate in where the focus is on white people, the folk, and, and, and white people benefit and privilege by the mere fact that the curriculum is written for them. Now, the interesting thing is that we might see changes within the curriculum by including more information about selective people of color, but we're not rethinking education. And I think the moment that we begin to rethink education, that's when we begin to possibly attempt to disrupt that, uh, disrupt white privilege. So for me, you know, th those basic structural elements, such as a curriculum, um, are the, are, are evidence of white privilege for me. It's not about that single white person. It's about the fact that there's an educational institution that constantly, um, praises, supports, and gives a narrative that makes a certain group of people feel like they belong here. Okay, and I, when we get late, much later on in this conversation to solutions, I'd like to hear more about how curricula and other bodies of canonical knowledge can change in order to address some of these fundamental equity issues. Uh, Gina, I wonder if I could ask you to, uh, uh, to reflect on white privilege and, uh, and, and how that term resonates with both white audiences and audiences of color. So I can say that um, white privilege, just thinking about this instance where people, white people can or cannot, don't have to have this conversation. For Karanja and I, I know since this pivot has taken place, we have been speaking all month, two months, three months, 
on top of all the work that we already do in the field. Um, and so there is no privilege behind being able to, so there's never a time that we can say, sorry, I don't think I'm gonna talk about that today. Um, it's part of our work, it's part of our life, it's every day for me. Um, there are certain instances, instances where it's, I'll share later as we move on to the different parts of the conversation, but you can clearly see it playing out in your workspaces, in your environmental spaces, there is a privilege when you can extract yourself from the conversation that's difficult. There is no privilege when you are the subject of the conversation and that becomes really difficult to navigate. Okay, thank you. That's terrifically helpful. Uh, Kimberly, can you talk about this uh, in, in the counseling context, uh, this notion of privilege uh, of, of people trying, you, you've talked about difficult conversations. How do you get people over that hump to be able to recognize uh, the way in which they relate to others and that others perhaps relate to them? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, well, first I wanted to touch on in terms of the mental and counseling aspect and white privileges. I think we see a disparity in the healthcare system because one of the things, you know, I think you mentioned it before, Dean Birdsell, is that we come from a society how the white way is the right way, right? And so I see this a lot in the mental health where even when we are a student or an individual comes to you for counseling and the diagnosis that we're automatically giving them is one that is the white way of giving them. So for example, we don't, we don't pay attention a lot of times to culture and race. And I think so many times in the healthcare system, people are misdiagnosed because, oh, well, you have this one symptom or you have the second sy symptom and that's, that's automatically assumed that you're depressed or whatever it may be. And so there's a lot of misdiagnosis I see. Um, so I wanted to actually touch on that. And then in terms of um, your question, how we kind of get over that hump is, in order to have those conversations and have successful conversations, I think we have to first actually understand our own racial cultural identity, right? And acknowledge and be open to admitting our own biases because we all have them. Um, and then we have to be comfortable and open and open to discussing topics of race and racism um, and really know how to ask questions too, ask the right questions. I think we also have to validate people's feelings um, and, you know, continuously encourage and express admiration for people who come out and talk about this. And that's the big piece is that I think a lot of times we don't consider people's feelings and we just say, oh, well, we kind of like, oh, you're just saying that. And I know other people who feel the same way, but I think it's really time that we dig a little deep and we pay attention more to the content and why, you know, somebody's feeling that way. What would you say, uh, what do you say to students who say, well, I, I, I have no biases. I, I, I don't see color. I treat everybody the same way. Uh, there may be uh, people on the phone call, this e the Zoom call, but, but this thing, uh, uh, this evening, um, who say, I, I don't have any um, implicit biases. How do you get them to think, uh, to, to rethink that claim? Um, any techniques or uh, tools that you routinely employ? Um, I usually first ask the question, why do they feel this way? Um, you know, why do they feel they don't see color because, or, you know, they're colorblind and, and it's, because I think that's impossible. You know, I think we all do see race. We all do see color. We, we may not want to admit it. We don't want to be open about it because like I said, sometimes it's uncomfortable. Uh, sometimes there's fear because the fear of if we say something that either, we're going to be called a racist or depending on who the individual is talking to, you know, they, it could, you know, hinder their role, whether it's an employee or a student. Um, so I think somebody who says that they're colorblind or they don't see color is just really trying to hide the truth of what their biases are. David, can I jump in here real quick as well? Please do. Um, to Kimberly's point, which I think is great, um, there's also a really big issue with the use of color blindness or not seeing color, right? Um, and so for me in the work that I do in black studies, color blindness is actually a bias. Um, the fact that you don't recognize that I'm a brown female is a problem. Um, and so I think that society has been reshaped in a way in which particularly people of color aren't, it's not, it's not, 
the right thing to do or it's not comfortable to support people of color. And so the best way to backtrack or backpedal out of that is by extracting them from their race or from their ethnicity or from their first and second languages and pretend that none of that exists and we're all one. And I think that's extremely problematic. When we get to a place of being accepting, right, um, or we get to a place of acknowledging our comfort, I mean, I think that that's another layer to this issue. But the fact that we walk into spaces where people would say, I don't have any bias, I'm actually colorblind, is a bias. That sort of needs uncovering as well. So that the erasure of the issue of color basically re-enshrines whiteness as the platform for the narrative. Right. Okay. Um, let me ask a question about our current circumstances, and I really mean uh, the, the last four months or so. Um, we've had an extraordinary shift in public opinion. Uh, people of all races uh, recognizing particularly racism against uh, Black Americans. Um, we have seen a, 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 what seems to me, and I'd like to hear how it seems to all of you, uh, a really sharp shift in the way that people understand issues of inequity in the face of the coronavirus pandemic, and then in the wake of the killing of George Floyd on May 25th, uh, the awareness of police brutality, I mean, police brutality did not start on May 25th, right? Um, why are we seeing the changes right now um, in the wake of the pandemic and in the wake of George, George Floyd's murder? And why didn't the thousands of murders that preceded his sparked the same kind of movement. Uh, I'd love to hear from each of you. Uh, and if we could start this time with Kimberly and then go to Regina and Karanja. Sure. Um, so I think my perspective in why we're seeing a movement now is, you know, I think with the George Floyd incident specifically, you know, it was clear, it was on video, you know, it, it was evident of what was happening. You know, whereas in the past in history, it was never recorded. And if you think about right now where we're in, we're in a pandemic, you know, people are working from home, people are staring at their screen, seeing what's on media, what's on TV. And finally, you know, people are coming out to say, you know, I want to do something about it. And, and I think we also have to look like who are the individuals that are coming out to protest, right? We having more millennials. And I, I, I have to say, I feel like the age group that is is more vocal. It's about, that's my perspective. At least currently more vocal. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a boomer, so there we used to be more vocal, but less so now. Um, thank you, Regina. I wonder if you could extend on that. And, and I, I just wanted to say this, and not, not to contradict uh, uh, Kimberly, because I think the videos are very different, but we have seen videos before, uh, many videos, uh, but they've been different, I would argue. But Regina, what, what, what do you think is the... So I agree with Kimberly to the point in where we're all frozen and the pandemic has put us in a position where recognition is much more required now than it has been, right? So um, we could talk about Rodney King, we could talk about Admiral Luimo, we could talk about any of, you know, um, any of the, the previous cases. And at the time, we could also remember where we were or we were moving, right? No one was really home watching this live on television. So I think that's part of it. The second point to Kimberly's, um, to, to Kimberly's point about who's participating, I think this is also very extremely problematic in that people of color have been protesting for so long about several of these issues. Um, and we have been watching it taking place and we have been writing about it, uh, publishing about it, discussing it, teaching it, advocating, protesting. But somehow our voice, and, and Karanja can pick this up next, but somehow our voices were not loud enough. And so once you get a different population articulating much of the same sort of arguments and protests that you have been doing for a while, for hundreds of years, then you start to get actual movement behind the movement. And I think that that needs examination as well, right? Why isn't the sort of movements that were developed um, much more advocated for, much more public than, than they are right now. Okay, thank you. Karanja? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, Kimberly and Regina, had, you know, hit, hit this uh, clearly. We have to recognize that we're in the midst of a pandemic. People are at home. 
people are not concerned or are not readily concerned with needing to go to their jobs. So, so they, one's job could have been a distraction, which didn't allow them to deal with some of the social issues that were developing. And since people are at home, they're able to see this. And then on top of that, they see this on, you know, social media, the news, wherever. Um, and by seeing it, they are inspired because they have a reason to get out of the house. Now, this doesn't mean that that's the only reason, but I think that that is a, a, a factor in trying to understand why the numbers are are the way that they are and why we have such large um, uh, protests. But I think, you know, we should recognize that as much as we understand the, um, the, the murder of George Floyd, we also need to throw in the mix the murder of Breonna Taylor. And the fact that how she died in the context and th that whole history um, is, 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 is important because there are a variety of places within the United States where, where people of color are organizing and have historically organized. And the only difference is those numbers are exploding because now we have this multiracial um, group of people that's, you know, bringing attention. But I think the, the, the only way that we can explain why things are boiling the way they are right now is because we're in the midst of a pandemic. That's it. Are the characteristics of social relationships in the pandemic part of the explanation as well? And I'm thinking of the intense outpouring of support for first responders that we saw again. Let's roll back the clock prior to May 25th uh, with people in this city leaning out of their windows, banging on pots and pans and clapping uh, for people who are over or predominantly people of color and new immigrants here in the city. So there's this sort of uh, context of warmth and support that is then immediately followed, you know, in, in interject into that environment, the murder of George, George Floyd. Is that part of this too, uh, that people see inequities, they see their interdependence, and then they're brought up sharply with a truly horrific example, uh, to Kimberly's point, captured by that eight minute and 46 seconds of video, uh, that I would argue is different in one major respect is that, you know, if you go back to the Eric Garner killing uh, six years ago, uh, that was on video too. But you couldn't see Eric Garner in those in those videos. He, he was completely got his body as he was dying was completely covered by police, and you couldn't see Officer Pantaleo who killed him, who had put him in the chokehold. You couldn't ever see his face. You could see the back of his shirt, uh, as opposed to seeing Derek Chauvin's face on that video, passive, obviously not agitated in any way. He was just going through the motions of killing somebody on the street. Um, do those things matter here too? And I'll toss that out to anybody who wants to take it. Regina, you're nodding. I'm always nodding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I find it very, again, I find this very problematic that there's pots and pans being, you know, banged and all of this other stuff at the height of a pandemic. I, I find this very problematic that we are recognizing the people who clean bathrooms, the people who take out garbage, the people who do the jobs that make the city run, that make the offices function, that make the schools and the universities a workable place. You know, the fact that we are recognizing this population at the height of the pandemic makes me feel as though people are more aware of their mortality than they are about these other social issues. And so the fact that people of color make up most of these jobs is, I mean, it's always been in my face, right? Growing up working class, this is something that I've grown up with seeing all of my life. So this is not, this is not any surprise to me who are in these jobs. Um, if we had, the best thing I saw was a young man working in a supermarket who said, please stop calling me a hero and raise my livable wage so I can pay my rent. And that to me just reinforced the idea that um, I, we are very distracted by a lot of what's going on and a lot of what has happened and we're sort of missing the goal of what we need to be doing to rehabilitate really is this is this a moment uh these problems these problematics that you've described uh embracing those is this still a moment that feels different in terms of the possibility of lasting change around some of the dynamics that you've mentioned, trying to get uh, fairer uh, pay policies, uh, building union support? Uh, you know, this is 
th this resonates through a wide variety of economic activities, a wide economic space, as well as a social space and, and, and an explicitly racial space. Uh, is this actually a pivot point where something different and more lasting can happen? I think we're yet to see. Um, I'm sorry, Karan, if I just cut you off, you look like you were going to motion to say something. Um, I think we are left to see what happens, you know, I kind of lean on the side of history. How much change have we seen since um, incidents like this have taken place? Um, when I watched Eric Garner murdered, I was horrified. Um, and so, you know, for me, I didn't need to see his whole body or I didn't need to see, you know, his face. The fact that this trauma was taking place on live television is very disturbing and yet everything fell silent. Um, the fact that we are not advocating for other issues is, is also very problematic, right? Um, the fact that we are in a version of lockdown and a pandemic, so we're all here, we're all talking, and there'll be more of these. At what point will we actually start to pivot to real change? And I think that's, I'm waiting to see that. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll want to follow up. Yeah, I don't, I mean, again, we're not in a position to say, all right, we know that change is going to come or we believe that change is going to come. And as a person of color, we are smart to be skeptical, smart to be critical and smart to ask a lot of questions because a lot of the things that we see as change, it's surface level change. So, you know, you want to take down a statue, you want to rename a building, all these, this is surface level stuff. When we get to the deep structure, when we get to the philosophies, perspectives, and ideas that inform the things that take place within these institutions, that's when we're actually going to see change. And we don't see that happening. What we have, what we do see happening is folks saying they're not going to have Aunt Jemima syrup no more, and we're going to call it something else. Or we're going to take this statue. That, you know, that's surface level. And the change, if we're dealing with, you know, racism as institutional and structural, the change needs to take place at the institutional and structural level. Are there any initiatives underway right now that give you any uh, hope for that attention to structural difference, structural movement? Um, there's the, all right, so we, we're aware of the Black Lives, we're aware of Black Lives Matters, but there's a component known as the Movement for Black Lives that has a policy initiative that attempts to deal with structural issues around potential reparations, around the relationship between police and communities of color. So I look at their work as a possibility, but again, it needs to take place within the larger context of this, of, of this nation, as opposed to, you know, groups pushing for something. And I don't see anything that's structural, structural that says, yes, this change is gonna take place and we're gonna see this outcome. Uh we recently saw uh, the city of Minneapolis uh, move to significantly change its police department. And we've seen much more thorough changes in cities uh, like Camden, New Jersey, where the police department was actually dissolved and reconstituted. Uh, are those encouraging developments or are those uh, part of the same sort of surface uh, attention that, uh, it, that is not consistent with the deeper change that many of us would like to see? And Karanja, let me let me put that stay with you on this one. For okay. Um, so, all right. When we're dealing with police, there's two approaches. Well, there's three. Either there's no problem, we're going to defund the police, or we're dealing with abolition. And I think that we need to understand all three approaches. And a lot of the changes that have that are taking place revolve around defunding and restructuring. And no one is really beginning to question why we need police and we need to ask the question do we need police and obviously everyone is, is going to say yes we do but we need to think about why we need them and when we need them because a good portion of the times when we think we need police they come and do harm we're talking about folks who are having um psychological issues and you call the police and somebody gets murdered as opposed to having a social worker there who's able to to defuse the situation so i think that you know that's my position around ar around the, the police in question i think that the ideas more towards abolition makes sense for me but it's also again as, as a as a 
as a step, maybe defunding is a part of it. Okay, thank you. Kimberly, before we move into uh, the solution phase of the conversation, I'd like to get your thoughts on, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, how this moment is or isn't different from what we've seen before. Uh, well, I wanted to just add on to what uh, Dr. Carl was saying. I actually to go back to your conversation with the police. I just want to say I agree with that. It's I feel like that's it's a very surface level what's going on now, and that you know we have to dig deep a little bit. I feel like we have to ask ourselves, you know, what are yeah, what are the police doing wrong? And I think there's so much stigma already with how police are, what they do, and so we have to get a little bit deeper a little bit. So that was, I just wanted to add on to that a little bit. Okay, um, just, oh, go ahead. Yeah, can you just repeat your question? <laughs> I wanted to. Uh, no, just, uh, I just wanted to uh, make sure that you had a chance to share your thoughts on whether this is a, a, a different moment uh, than what we've seen before, if there are fresh possibilities today that might not have been available, even though all of the same things, absent the pandemic, uh, were on the table a year ago at this time. I think I agree with, you know, both our panelists. It's it's really hard to say if change is coming, you know, because like we've been saying, it, it it's at a more of an institutional level. You know, earlier when we talked about structural racism, you know, it's about, we have to really look at what are the policies, right? And changing those policies because we can make minor changes here and there, but it's the bigger picture. And so I don't, I don't know if I feel like I see change coming. It's hard. It's really hard to say on my end. Have you been teaching during this period? Uh, has this been one of the one of the times that you've been uh, at the head of the class? Yes. And do you see, do you see different kinds of conversations among your students at this stage? Yes. Um, well, so as you know, this semester was tough because we switched from in person yes. to virtual. So you know, my class was so much more challenging because in my class we talk about multicultural and diversity issues we bring up topics like microaggressions racism and first of all the conversations have been hard i think because it having those conversations online is not the same because we can't really pick up people's feelings and how and what's going on um, but the conversations have been bigger because of what's happening you know and Actually, right when we switched to virtual, it was when the pandemic happened. And but specifically, um, I had a lot of students in my class who were seeing a lot of racist attacks towards their Asian students. So that was actually the hot topic, um, you know, and with, you know, the Chinese flu and this and that and all of those comments. And a lot of our students were like, well, how do I address these situations with my clients? Because I don't, I've never been through it. So yeah. Okay, interesting. And and the, the, this this new dynamic of seeing ourselves always within a bezel is a is a confounding factor in anything we want to shift. I'm not teaching now myself, but I've found that in conversations with colleagues uh, on on this kind of a platform, that there's actually been much more self disclosure. Uh, partially because I I don't know people are speaking from their dining rooms and their bedrooms, but uh, uh, we we can talk about that as we move on. Um, I, I'd like to pivot a little bit and start thinking about how we, uh, and by we I mean anybody, and certainly any of, the, any of us here, uh, but this larger society can begin to make the changes that we want to see. What should we be doing? There are a plethora of policy ideas out there. Karanja, you mentioned reparations. Uh, there, uh, uh, Regina, you talked about uh, wage equity. Um, uh, we, we could talk about uh, ending redlining practices for uh, loans and housing. We can talk about uh, uh, access to higher education, the nature of the curriculum, Karanja, you raised that earlier. Uh, what, you know, a lot of these are very big and it's very difficult for anyone to get a sense of how do I begin to affect that change? So thinking on the, of this on two levels, one is what should we be aiming for as, you know, somebody make the policy change? And what should we be thinking about ourselves as ways to advance this agenda from the various positions in which we sit, whether that's in the academy, uh, whether it's one of the alumni listening who's out in her work life and perhaps working for a bank. Um, uh, what should we be thinking about right now? And Regina, I wonder if we could begin with you. 
We should start with reading. I think much of what's happening is we are jumping ahead of this moment in that we are looking for solutions without having a historical framework. Um, and we are having the same conversation in 2020 that a colleague told me just the other day, he had 40 years ago. And that unnerved me, the fact that he was advocating for civil rights and social justice and said to me, I think you're doing a great job, but guess what? I said this 40 years ago and nobody listened to me. That makes me very uncomfortable. It makes me feel as though we have a major hurdle. The other thing, so reading I think is key. Um, and a lot of people would disagree and say, we don't have time to read. We have to you know, get into action. But I think if you read, as you move towards change, you have a framework to go on from. The second point I think is that more of us need to be at the table. Uh, we are talking at a distance. We are talking on the move. We are giving everyone advice on what the changes that need to happen. Here are the steps to take it, but we're not actually at the table making the change. Um, and in, you know, I say this again, in 2014, I did a TEDx talk on the food system and how that is very much part of a racist structure. Um, and, and, and part of it was, can you get people who are the most afflicted or affected at the table to have these conversations. So many times the changes that are employed or the changes that we wish to see are being spoken about and targeting people that we think most need them. And those very people are not at the table. They're not the ones making changes. They're not the ones suggesting here, this might work since we've been under this kind of structure. Here, I, you know, I've been a victim of this or I've experienced this a lot of the changes that we're seeing are not coming from a root, they're coming from the top down, and that's very problematic. And just sticking with that before I go to Karanja, uh, that suggests that the institutions themselves have to make the change that the people who would be advocating for the change would want them to make. So there's a chicken and egg issue there. How, how do you address that question? Um, so I think, as far as much as we exist to do these panels, to have these conversations, to write these essays that get circulated and celebrated, I think we are also very alive and very worth getting a seat at the table to have these kinds of conversations. Um, during the food movement, you know, when I did that whole project, I actually took my students out and we investigated where were the communities hit hardest. Um, it, it kind of comes back to this moment of Thanksgiving is the most popular time for people to come into New York City to serve food to the homeless. But guess what? They were hungry the day before, they'll be hungry the day after. So this approach of having these conversations and then putting together task forces, to putting together committees with people who are actually not on the ground is just very circular. And yes, David, that really becomes the chicken before the egg with no real solution. The fact that all these companies uh, academic institutions as well, put out all of these statements and things haven't happened. And yes, the, obviously they can't happen overnight, but if I'm having the same conversation with someone who's been doing this work 40 years ago, we have a real problem. Okay, thank you. Karanja? Yeah, I, I think that Regina um, was, was on point to start by saying having an understanding of history because what we tend to do is understand the civil rights movement, 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, and we get to like 1980, and we don't deal with what happened from 1980 to 2006, and then what's happened within these last couple of cycles. But a lot of the focus and advances that were taking place from 1954 to 1980 were literally like chopped on so many different levels so that by the time that we have the 80s come along and Reaganomics come along that we then have the need to rebuild and then we get Obama elected and people are like he's the savior but no he's not the savior because he's working in the context of white supremacy and then when we get Trump it's like oh my goodness you know we're, 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 we're in shock but we should understand history to, to, to recognize how and why we got to this moment. Um, that, that's one point. The second point I want us to, 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 to think about and consider is if we recognize that racism is institutional and structural, there are individuals who are in these institutions and in these structures. Therefore, they need to have knowledge, they need to be reading, they need to learn so that when they get into these spaces, 
they have a knowledge base to push back. So, you know, I love teaching because I'm hopefully, I'm providing something for my students who might be in the HR department and might have the ability to see a particular resume with a particular name. And we know the data on this, okay? Because the data says that if you have a name that doesn't sound quote unquote white, normal, within this American sense that somebody's gonna bypass that resume. But if my student knows the, the history and the knowledge and, and the information and the research around this topic, they might be like, hold up. That's how we begin to make change by having people within the, the, the right position. But then on top of that, like Regina is saying, it's one thing to have members of the majority within particular places, but it's another thing to have voices that have been silenced and, you know, taken out of the conversation there. And when we deal with questions around education, for me, it's not only making sure that we have people of color within these spaces, but we also need to recognize that students who have come out of public school um, uh, systems have a voice and have a perspective because they have an experience that needs to be included within the dialogue. It, again, that top-down approach says that it's going to be certain groups of people, but yet and still the students who should be benefiting the most are left out of the dialogue. This is part of be being also, right, in the presence of privilege, where you cannot just go to graduate school, be at the top of your class, come out, get a job, right, that's tenure track, gain tenure, write, publish, and continue to move in this sort of sequence, right? For a lot of people, particularly people of color who do justice work, our job primarily is, as Karanja was just saying, is to move the next generation up through the job market, right? And to sort of guide them. And so we have an abundance of responsibility to the community. So the PhD is not just a PhD to become an ac academic. It is to get um, our population moving and into different fields to make sure that they are prepared too. Because at the end of the day, if you think about how we've moved into our different ciphers, I mean, it, it's very difficult to see us in, in, in a variety of different spaces. Okay, I, I want to come back to the university in just a moment, but let me get uh, Kimberly in here. Uh, uh, Kimberly, your own sense of ways to get people to engage. Uh, and I, 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 don't want you, I don't want to make you always the person to talk about the mental health perspectives, but uh, given that you're dealing with students' own difficulties and feeling efficacious in these, uh, in these arenas, uh, how do you make them feel more so and how do you engage colleagues in this kind of discussion as well? Uh, well, I think the first thing is what our panelists have said is we have to educate ourselves. Um, know the history, know where all of this is stemming from, what is it coming from? And then the other part is, you know, I, I tell my students or that, that are in my class, like you have to immerse yourself in it, you know, and make your voices heard, you know, and part of that also is in order to see change, to, to have something come about is get involved, you know, whether it's getting involved in your State or you're contacting your local officials, see what they're doing in your community, uh, learning what's happening in the community, you know, take some time to donate, to volunteer. I always, actually part of one of my assignments for my students is I have them actually get themselves immersed in a culture or a group that they're not familiar with. And it's a whole semester project. And at the end of the semester, they come out and they, they, they kind of go over the presentation and what they've learned and what they've experienced. And, you know, so, the only way we can see change and the only way we can learn and make things happen is if we educate ourselves, but also get involved, whether it's volunteering, you know, like I said, or getting involved with local or political officials. Thank you so much. I, I, I want to go back, Karanja, to pick up on that thread about changes in the curriculum that you raised close to the beginning of the conversation. Uh, and everybody, or almost everybody on this uh, call, either works at a university or graduated from this one. Um, so I wonder if you could say about this, uh, either this work that we're doing or this curriculum that we experienced, how can it be made, what should, be, what should it be made to reflect in order to advance the kind of agendas that we've been talking about here this evening? Uh, let me, so for instance, um, I think that if we're going to, we're looking at this on the K through 12 level, um, 
cultural diversity is more than just dressing up like somebody, eating somebody's food, and and those elements of culture that are taught about groups of people. When we think about culture, we don't think about thought systems. And we need to think about worldviews and systems that are connected to culture to recognize that there are different ways of being within the world. There are different ways of making sense of the world. Those are basic things that can take place on a K through 12 level, I think. But when it comes to higher education, we need to deal with traditional disciplines and how they treat and how they include non-white people. And by this, I mean, we can have a department of psychology, a department of sociology, a department of economics, department of political science that can teach courses and never engage the experiences of people of color. Or when you do engage the experiences of people of color, they're engaged as a problem. But we don't know about the black political scientists, those political scientists of color. We don't know about the fact that, yes, there's psychology, but there's African-centered psychology. There's a black psychology. There's cultural psychologies that are developed. These are not things that are, that are taught within um, higher education, at least social science and um, humanities disciplines. And this is, I, I think that, that that's how we begin to start. But it's a two-pronged approach. It's about understanding diversity as it relates to thought systems that can take place in the K-12 curriculum. But when you get into higher education, you can't come to Black or Latino studies and intend to get everything that you need when the traditional disciplines should be doing their part to illuminating these stories and making connections. So this needs to be in core curricula? This needs to be something that all students are exposed to? Of course, of course. Okay. Um, I, I, I want to get to uh, Regina and Kimberly for your thoughts on this question as well, but I just wanted to say to Greg and Alexandria that after we do that, uh, I think we're going to be ready to go to questions that you've harvested from the chat sequence, so uh, just stand by. Uh, I look forward to hearing those. Regina, I wonder if you could uh, uh, just extend on Karanja's point and add your own. Yeah, in higher ed, um, where, I've, where I've spent so many years now, I think the key is to recognize where is our value um, first. And if we are using this time to put out a statement of solidarity, we need to reflect on what our goals are as a university. And that goes for any institution. Um, I am troubled that it has taken the death of George Floyd for institutions to recognize that they are in solidarity with Black students, with Black faculty. Um, we haven't even gotten to other cultural groups either, which is another issue. Um, and so I think rethinking value, rethinking participatory um, projects. So diversity doesn't just mean hiring Black people, or it doesn't just mean checking off, you know, having a box when you're going through a search committee and you, you know, you're watching PowerPoint slides that tell you how to make sure you are hiring the right person without being racist and being equitable. I think those conversations need to be had in person. Those kinds of things need to be um, created, again, with having every member who is supposed to be a value at the table co-creating these, these, um, these different tools that need to be employed. But simple statements, um, that then don't get followed up on problematic, um, having these conversations of, we need to create a diverse environment, so let's just hire some Black people and call it diverse. All of these are the wrong way to go about this problem. And once this falls out of fashion, where will people of color lie? Where will we be? And at the end of that, how much value will be placed in our work after this moment? I just told Karanja the other day, we are so popular right now. When things simmer down, I wonder if your phone's going to ring. I wonder. Right. So, uh, so one of the things that you're going to be looking for is how persistent these uh, opportunities are. Yes. Yes. Kimberly, thanks so much for that. Kimberly, you've got the last word before we go to the audience questions. Um, I don't think I have too much to add. I think they both... Uh, really made the points, but uh, Regina, I wanted to say that I see that happen a lot where a lot of times, you know, we're checking off a box to meet certain numbers or stats and meet that requirement. And it's, it's really sad that, you know, and sometimes it's hard, you know, my previous place of employment where it was more about, okay, well, do we meet those numbers or we need to have diverse. So we have to bring in whether it's, a black person or a female or a male gender sometimes too plays a role and so 
it's disappointing to see that. And right, I think it, at the end of the day, we have to come together and ask ourselves, what is our real goal here? What is it that we really want to accomplish? And the university could define itself much more broadly toward those goals rather than a narrow vision of academic excellence and something that would be instead uh, much much more resonant with community values and community needs, both inside and adjacent to the academy, right? Okay, thank you so much. This has been absolutely wonderful, and I know there's much more to come. Uh, audience, this is your opportunity. You are going to be ably voiced by Alexandria Jackson and Greg Leparati. Uh, so Alexandria, I see your mic is ready to go, and what's our first question from the, from the floor? Thank you. Um, we've had uh, so many amazing questions presented to us in the chat. Um, I want to start first just with a question um, that was asked directly to Dr. Carroll from Samantha McBride. Uh, with regard to the structural changes you've outlined, do you see uh, more of a possibility uh, that Biden is elected and the Senate uh, will shift to a Democratic majority or is a new political party necessary? Uh. I don't have faith in Biden, I'm sorry. I don't have faith in the Democratic Party, I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, Biden can be elected and we still deal with this foolishness that's, that, that's going on. We can have a Democratic Senate and we'll still deal with it. Maybe not at the level, but it's still, we're still gonna be dealing with these issues because we have to remember that the Black Lives Matters movement came into creation during the presidency of Barack Obama. Um, the next question is from Fiola McFarlane. Why don't white people who benefit from uh, white privilege understand how it harms others? This is for all of our panelists. Who'd like to take that one first? <laughs> I think it's part of the privilege in which you don't have to spend much time thinking about how what you do on a daily basis affects other people. That, that really is the center of the privilege, where you can really go about your day, go about your business, take care of your responsibilities, and not give a second thought to who might be affected um, by the choices that you're making or by the things that you're able to access while other people are not. Okay, thank you. Um, and just an, another interesting question uh, centered around the concept of cancel culture. Uh, is the current cancel culture a hindrance to having candid conversations around race? Sorry, what was that? Repeat that out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, is the current cancel culture a uh, hindrance to having candid conversations around race? Do people think that they're just going to be canceled? It, it, because the cancel culture increases the fear of public participation and right. consequences from that. Great question. I know, Re Regina, you said you were always nodding, but you were nodding, so you get to answer for us. <laughs> Um, I do believe that change comes when there's active dialogue. Um, I don't know that I, you know, feel strongly about cancel culture or, you know, I'm, I read banned books. That's my thing. Um, so I don't know that I, I'm on either side of that argument. I just feel, though, that when you get people in a room um, who have differing opinions, there's a lot better of a conversation that comes out of it than when everyone is thinking the same. Thinking of uh, the, the experience of, well, the, the, the voice uh, anxieties of your students, any of you, have your students talked about uh, fears in, in the context of cancel culture or, or adjacent terms that they might be concerned about? I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, I teach my students to use their voice and to not necessarily silence people but to like you know speak truth to power and as you speak truth to power you got to have dialogue and dialogue is not going to happen when you're trying to shut people down now maybe there are people that need to be silenced and shut down but let's hear them out and let's engage them directly um before we just are quick to dismiss folks yeah i haven't seen it come up with my students but i mean i'm in a field of where i'm teaching those who want to be counselors and 
that's part of what we do is teaching them to have a voice, but also when they have a voice to make sure that their client that they're working with is being heard. And I, I would just add before Alexandria going to your next question that uh, one of the features of cancel culture, I think, is that there are people who have uh, occupied positions of power and prominence who for the first time feel truly vulnerable uh, to mass movements that can interrupt their income, their access to uh, media platforms, et cetera. And this is, I'm not saying this to deny that the internet can be a wild and woolly place and that people can behave, uh, the, you know, the, the, the savage mob uh, can come to people without the kinds of process that Karanja was just talking about. Uh, but I think a lot of this is a, a feeling of vulnerability uh, on the part of people who didn't have to feel vulnerable before. And that's one of the reasons we're seeing this written about so intensively. Um, I just wanted to share that with the person who asked the question as well. So uh, moving on to our next question, which um, two questions from two different people that kind of uh, mirror each other. What do you think institutions, including educational, need to do to keep the momentum going? So this is just um, not just a moment stuck in time. Um, and then just a follow up, what is Baruch planning to do um, in terms of strategizing, organizing, and implementing um, changes to ensure that these issues are addressed at their core? Who'd like to jump in first? Granja? Regina, I'm passing the baton to you first. I was actually going to pass the baton to David. Um, because as, I'm sorry, David, as an administrator, yeah, I think as an administrator, you have more, um, you have a more of a, a horse in the racer, so to speak, to be able to share what administratively is taking place. Um, what I've said earlier to that question about what needs to happen is we need a more robust curriculum. That's number one. And the fact that, you know, at Baruch, since the question was posed about Baruch specifically, you really only need to take one cultural studies course to fulfill a requirement. Um, and so how much conversation are you having in one course about these issues, right? Um, not too much. And then even when you decide to minor in the, in Black and Latino studies or, or minor in something like this, there's only three courses to take. So I think we need to take a look at that and how, and how that works. Um, but as part of the administration, um, I'll pass that on to, to David. I'm happy to talk about that. Now, I'm, of course, Dean of the Mark School, so I'm most familiar with what happens in the Mark School uh, rather than college-wide. But I do know of some activities that are afoot uh, throughout the college. Uh, and of course, we are in still the first month of our new president's tenure. Uh, David Wu joined us on July 1st. Uh, and he's hit the ground running with a number of task forces that are examining the future posture of the college, largely right now oriented around our reopening in the fall uh, and the immediate logistical challenges that we're all facing throughout higher education uh, and that we face as a vertical campus uh, here at Baruch College. Uh, but I, I see a couple of kinds of things happening, uh, at, at least with regard to activities that I'm aware of in the Zicklin School and I'm aware of within uh, the Mark School. Um, those have to do with thinking about what kind of training and orientation uh, that people need to undergo to examine their personal uh, biases, uh, to think about how those biases are reflected in institutions. And I'm talking predominantly about faculty, staff, and administration uh, in those schools to try to think about what it means to be, uh, if we look at the Baruch faculty, a predominantly white faculty in a predominantly uh, uh, diverse institution where a majority of our students are people of color uh, uh, across a wide spectrum of racial and ethnic backgrounds. Um, We've talked a lot in the Mark School uh, about trying to do what we've been talking about uh, the Karanja raised a little, uh, a little while ago, so that it's not possible to graduate from the program without having an introduction to issues of structural racism uh, and inequity. And we're trying right now, we're in the midst of, and this well preceded our pandemic uh, and, uh, and, and the, the, the protests that we've seen over the last two months, 
uh, we've been reframing our Master of Public Administration curriculum. Um, so we're putting right into the first course in that sequence, uh, we're shifting it from an overview of the public sector to an overview of the public sector that specifically highlights and elevates questions uh, of social equity, of structural racism, and of how that has resonated throughout the history of the country. Uh, and this is a con <coughs> pardon me, this is a conversation we're having right now. Um, we're looking at, and I think this is college-wide, uh, how our practices um, have either advanced the interests of or acted against the interests of uh, underrepresented communities on our campus. Uh, that's an early conversation, still underway. Uh, but we think that it's important, too, to note that we approach some of this through a position of strength. Uh, so that in the Mark School, for example, uh, we have right now the most diverse student body of any public affairs program in the United States. And we are the only first professional program in New York State to graduate a higher percentage of uh, Latinx and black students than of white or Asian students. There are only two percentage points worth of difference, but in the vast majority of programs across the country and in all of them in New York State except ours, uh, graduation rates are lower for Latinx and black students. Um, so that's not to say, hey, everything's hunky-dory, we must be doing it right. Uh, it's to say that there are strengths that we recognize here too, and drawing on the uh, experiences and the accomplishments of our alumni, many of whom I see arranged around the screen here, uh, becomes a way to sustain these conversations and drive it into institutions that can have resonance beyond the academy. And I'm gonna end there. Uh, that the point that uh, I, I believe Karanja made first, but it was echoed and amplified by Regina, that uh, the university does many things other than educate people in a classroom. Uh, it connects to employment, it prepares people for co-curricular experiences, it provides those co-curricular experiences. It's a research partner with the cities in which our institutions are located. Uh, we are important cultural assets and sites for conversation. Uh, and we should be, in my view, and this is really me editorializing, but there are actions that we're taking and conversations like this are a reflection of it, uh, we need to own our role Role as a, a gatekeeper that can open those gates and invite people into conversations where we are educated uh, as much as we are providing services for the community. Uh, and that multi-party, multi-directional uh, conversation needs to become an integral part of how we understand our roles and our own institutional learning curves. Great, excellent. Um, I'm just moving on to the next question here. How do you suggest business leaders overcome unconscious bias and affinity bias in the hiring and promotion of Black, Indigenous, and people of color? Okay, who would like to take on the business leader question? Regina. Uh, no, I was just going to ask Alexandra, could you repeat that one more time? I sure. Like there's a little feedback. How do you suggest business leaders overcome unconscious bias and affinity bias in hiring and promoting Black, Indigenous, uh, and people of color? Who would like to pick this one up? We don't have a deep uh, HR bench here, I think, among the panel this evening. But uh, let, let me say one thing about this. There, there is uh, freely available on the internet, and perhaps we can post it in the chat, uh, a, 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 an assay of implicit bias that comes out of Harvard University. And it's, a very, it's an eye-opening experience, and I'd encourage anybody listening uh, to take it. Uh, trying to understand where your biases are. Now, this is a very, uh, it's extensively validated instrument. It's free. You can take it for free. You can take it multiple times um, and, and give a sense of where you fall on a spectrum of, of, of bias uh, and how that might shape your own attitude. I mean, we can't do anything that we don't that we don't know our own postures and orientations toward. Uh, so starting with instruments to learn about things like that, but then following the extensive uh, catalog of best practices in HR offices around the country, where companies like Xerox and others, there have been extensive, uh, there's been extensive movement toward being able to involve a much more diverse workforce. Uh, those lessons are out there and they need to be better publicized. And if you don't know them, uh, there are places to go and learn about them. And we, we can, do our part by making sure that people understand that uh, wealth of experience and practice here. 
I'll just add as well that I think um, that while those practices are being reviewed within HR or, or in these particular designated offices, there also needs to be value placed on the employees that are already there. So taking a look at the expertise um, among the faculty, let's say we were talking about academia, taking a look at the expertise among the faculty, taking a look at um, who's leaving, why they're leaving, what are the issues. I think creating a space where you can have these engaging dialogues with people before they up and quit or before they start forging these conversations with other groups who start to realize, wow, that's actually happening to me too. And no one feels safe enough to speak out. So what they do is they just resign. That leaves a gaping hole in the company or in the institution um, without ever having these critical dialogues. It's re retention is absolutely every bit as important as getting people to the door. And often that means the more profound change in culture than just the act of getting people to the door. Just um, piggybacking on the concept of retention, uh, how do we transition from talking about these issues to making tangible actions within our own organizations? Anybody want to pick that up? Karanja, let me see. Could, could you share some insights there? How does this, how does this actually drive into the organization? Um, I, I think that some of the points that we've already outlined kind of speak to the, the, the question asked. Um, for me, it's about understanding history. It's about understanding uh, silenced voices and marginalized voices and bringing them into the, bringing them into the discussion. I, I honestly have nothing new for, the, for, for this question because I think we've laid out pretty much what can be done and what should be done. The question really becomes who's willing to do the work because there's a certain level of work that requires sacrifice. And a lot of folks ain't willing to sacrifice. We're willing to quickly point out, oh, that's an issue, that's an issue, that's an issue, but we're not willing to sit and take the time. And we can connect this back to people being able to protest right now. They had the time and they're, they were, they're able to attempt to go in the streets to make some sort of change. But we have to learn to take back some of the time that we would use to watch sports events, that we would use to be at a bar, that we would use to be in other places and use that time and redirect that en uh, energy around the issues that we're trying to talk about tonight. And share the resources to that point, right? Share the resources, share the information and have these critical dialogues while you're paying attention not while there's a pandemic and we're stuck in front of the screen and this is how we start getting a stream of our information, right? Just anecdotally, um, I'll just share that when I was the chair of the Black and Latino Studies Department, I struggled for resources to do some of the things I wanted to do departmentally that didn't have sort of, you know, it had the base of the department at the very need. The, you know, our hiring, wanting to expand the faculty, all the different kinds of things that I had spent the entire year attempting to do and I just wasn't getting that in return. So if you're not feeling empowered as someone who's been given this privilege to lead a department or to be in charge, if you're in corporate America and you have a position of power or assumed power, if you're not given the resources or you're not given the support, it becomes very challenging to continue. So yeah, so then once that happens, Karanti, you do put on the sports, you do turn your back, you do check out and you don't wanna be part of it anymore because you've been disenfranchised in your own setting. I think that's also very important to consider. Let me add one uh, sort of counterintuitive suggestion that one way to achieve change in your own institution is to get involved in organizations that shape the contours of success for your institution. Uh, Baruch doesn't sit uh, by itself, right? It's obviously part of the CUNY system, but it's part of a higher education system nationally that values certain things, uh, really high SAT scores, high salaries on first job placement, uh, these sort of standard metrics that may actually militate fairly strongly against the, uh, the more affirmative community engaged things that a university might be able to do in the interests of some of its students. So a number of years ago, I mean, I'm, I'm in the public policy environment, right? But I got involved in NASPA, which is the accrediting body, uh, and became president of that organization uh, and, uh, over a three-year period. I, I stepped down out of those roles a year and a half ago. Um, but the, uh, 
the idea was if we're not sharing the experiences that we harvest from Baruch College to shape the expectation of what institutions should do, well, maybe they don't care so much about being able to give voice to diverse communities because there's no diverse community making the case. Um, so getting involved in the next layer up is actually a way to create reward structures that can make your institution more responsive. And I just like everybody to think about what kind of meaning that might have from whatever professional position you're in now. And I think basically to summarize what everyone's saying is that we have to take action. And this might sound very cliche, but sometimes change in order for us to see change happen, it has to come within us first and we have to make that first step. So we can complain, we can say a lot of things, but sometimes change doesn't happen if we're not the first ones to go and make that step. That's right, absolutely right. But I do want Karanja to let me watch the Yankees game opening day Thursday night. So just being clear, there are priorities. Um, just going back to Regina's point about uh, doing the reading, what would you recommend reading um, to understand his, uh, racism in America? Nothing that's just been published. So, and that's not to take away from the newer writers, because I think there are some amazing things that are coming out right now. But we have to remember the environment in which they're being um, uh, sold or, or advertised, right? I think starting from as earliest as possible will set a really great foundation and groundwork for how you get up to the point of reading something that just came out in 2019 to 2020. Um, it's, it's very easy to find on the New York Times book list the book that is addressing racism and anti-racist work right now, but you're missing an entire history of people of color. And so again, we're, it's just, it becomes very circular. If you have no foundation, you're never going to get to the end. I'll add a, a, a book that is, I don't think it, it's not as recent as the ones that um, Regina is referring to, but um, a book that I've used for a number of semesters um, is a book by Eduardo Bonilla Silva entitled Colorblind Racism. And that book really encapsulates the moment not that we're in right now, but the, 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 the moment that surrounds where, the moment that we're in right now. Because when we talk about white privilege, when we talk about colorblindness, when we talk about all of these concepts, he provides a way of understanding how racism continues to persist um, within the society, even though people say, I don't see color, even though people say, like, you know, I'm colorblind. I um, mean, one thing about the, that, that whole colorblind idea and concept is that you erase people's identity the moment that you say that you don't see them you know they, there's identities there's experiences there's narratives that are connected with how people have been raced how people have particular ethnicities so forth and so on so you say that you're colorblind you don't see color you wipe them away thank you so much for that i'm just going to um, give uh, the microphone to my colleague, Greg Lathorati, to just finish up our questions for this evening. A couple more questions. This has all been great. Uh, we got another question, actually, um, about how do you reconcile the legacies um, and honor uh, p historic figures who have had positive impacts on society, but who also have problematic aspects in their background? You don't wait till they die to celebrate them. So... What I've been seeing coming out of John Lewis right now, um, who just passed away this weekend, um, I always wonder how much of us who are not doing this work know about his contributions to American society prior to his death. Um, so I think recognizing people's work, this goes back to the point I made earlier about value, recognizing people's works, um, their contributions, what they have to say, how they participate in society is as valuable when they are alive, if not more, so that we can keep the work going than waiting to celebrate them in their death. I just want to add, I think it's also about telling the whole story and the whole narrative of, 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 of people. So like, you know, when I talk about Martin Luther King, I talk about him and his complexity and in his contradictions. And in order to do that, you humanize him. And when you humanize him, you actually might empower students to realize that they can be better than he was. And that's why it's important to 
not only shine the good stuff, talk about the, the, the bad and the contradiction so that you have a holistic um, experience of a person to, to help us understand. A few more questions we have here. Um, so how do students deal with racism from professors? Because some professors' tone, body language, time allowed to talk can be different towards white students as to black students. And sometimes they can be, um, students of color can be ignored. So what are some ways that students can overcome that? So obviously I'm not a student at Baruch, but my <laughs> students come to me and they tell me these, the, the, these stories um, of actual experiences with professors. As a matter of fact, I had a student last semester who was taking a class in a department that will name, na remain nameless. And she was like, you know, she doesn't even feel comfortable to speak because whenever issues around race, gender, sexual orientation um, come up, the person is combative around those issues. So she is silenced and feels silenced. Um, but again, I think, you know, that's potentially one of the benefits of Black and Latino studies because those students come into our space where we provide them with support and hopefully provide them with a knowledge base so that if they're ever in a space like that again, they have the courage to push back against it. Anyone else want to jump in? The, the, the only thing that I would uh, would add is that, you know, there are, are, are questions of degree from microaggressions to, uh, you know, o o overtly uh, racist actions in the classroom that prevent a student from learning, recognizing that anything uh, of, of any degree is, is a barrier and a drag on process. But Baruch does have resolution procedures through the Chief Diversity Officer's Office. Uh, I see that she's on the, on, on the line with us today. Um, but there, there are formal complaint structures that students can avail themselves of as well. Uh, and hi, Mona. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and there, there are also options to uh, work through the ombuds to have conversations. Those conversations can be private until the point that you wish to go public with them. So I just wanted to say that uh, in addition to uh, the kind of moral fortitude and creating spaces and having faculty members talk with their colleagues, and we find that that is frequently a conversation that we have to have with colleagues, um, there are formal procedures available to students. I just want to make clear that that is available. Got it. Um, let's see here. We're, we're running out of time here, but I'll get in one more question here. We talked earlier about how, you know, why are people who have white privilege, how do they not see the, how the, they privilege from that? And the answer was, well, they're blind to it because of their privilege. So someone asks, how can we convince the people who benefit from institutional racism to change their minds? You actually got Regina to shake her head. So now you have to start to speak because you're shaking your head. I have to try to hold my, my body. Um, you can't, right? So one of the books I would recommend, and, and for anyone who's on here who took my classes many, many years ago, I'm still teaching Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. This is a 1969 publication. Um, but in the book, in the very beginning of the text, it talks about every person coming into their own awakening as an oppressor or as an oppressed when it's due time. That's not something that anybody else can point out for you. And that's where problems start, right? So for me to call someone an oppressor, I further oppress them. Or for me to tell someone that they have oppressed another person, that does not make me a liberator. It's also not my responsibility. It's not anybody's responsibility, right? So going through these sort of journeys of awakening or recognizing, um, I would say, and maybe it's my privilege as a person of color to say that it's not that hard to recognize when you're getting a privilege and someone else is not. I mean, today, 2020, the writing is on the wall. We kind of understand how these structures are in place and how they're working. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all of your insight, everyone. I'm going to kick it over to Neftali now uh, to, to wrap up. I just want to say thank you all for this timely discussion that we, I believe, all of us on this um, line needed to hear and all your perspectives. And um, before we go, I just want to give everyone an opportunity to give some final thoughts and then we're say goodnight. We'll start off with Kimberly. 
Thank you. Uh, no, I just wanted to say overall, thank you for having me on this panel. I think, you know, we're, this was a very needed conversation. It's an important topic. And this is just the beginning. I feel like there's so much more. We could probably go on for hours to talk about this topic. Um, you know, and I think we've given some great suggestions on how to start making change or how to start having those conversations, but more conversations need to be had. So again, this is just the beginning and I hope that we continue to have conversations and topics and webinars like this. Dr. Bernard? Um, Neftali, thank you so much for inviting us and for putting this great panel together. I think that um, the synergy among the four of us was great. And so the discussion was also very good. Um, and I, I just want to thank all the participants who are on the phone or who are um, somewhere in the background listening. It is great to see that we began at 400 and an hour and a half later, we still have 90 something people who are still participating in the conversation. It shows one that there is a need to have this in a sort of public setting, despite the Zoom approach. Um, it is important to have these conversations. I hope that some of you who are listening feel empowered to take this as a stepping stone and have these conversations in other spaces where you work, where you live, um, among your friends who maybe are struggling at this time um, on either side of the spectrum. I think that's important. I will also close by saying that while I'm very grateful that these conversations are happening and, and very much so, um, it really is time to get to work now. I can piggyback off of everything that Regina said and say thank you for the opportunity and we're ready to do the work. And let me echo everybody's mm -hmm. thoughts. Thank you so much, wonderful panel. Uh, thanks all of the, to all of the alumni and colleagues who have come this evening. Um, this kind of conversation, and thank you, uh, Nefti and Alexandria and Greg and uh, alumni relations generally, uh, it's, it's important to have these conversations. You know, we are a community that spans generations, uh, and I can see that just looking around the screen when I've been able to do that, uh, and wonderful to see some uh, old friends on those, uh, on those screens as well, so great, great to see your faces. Um, this college has, I think, a special opportunity and a special role. We've celebrated our diversity for years, uh, but we haven't used that necessarily always to advance the agendas that we've outlined this evening and agendas adjacent to them. Uh, but we need to become that voice uh, in a very consistent way. And I think having frank conversations like this on a regular basis is the way to begin to get people who have been on the sidelines uh, into the forefront uh, and make this institution even better uh, than it already is. Uh, so I'm very grateful to have been here this evening and thanks for having me uh, in as moderator tonight. I learned a lot. Thank you everyone. And until the, until the next conversation happens, make sure you guys get into some good trouble. Take care. Take care everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone.